why do you do what you do? Ultimately for me, I think it always comes down to the aesthetic, right? And the story behind an image. What drew you to the education side of photography? I'm good at simplifying complex topics and uh, making them accessible. Do you think it will replace certain genres of photography? Yeah, I think it's going to greatly impact the industry. Tell us something that people don't know about you and that they can't find online on any of your, your platforms. Being mentally healthy allows us to thrive creatively. Were you depressed? Welcome. Thank you. Sean, good to be yeah. here. It's good to be here too, um, man. Thanks for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule, <laughs> which uh, we'll talk about, I'm sure, uh, in today's chat. But give us a very quick introduction about you know who you are, what you're doing, how you found yourself here with me today. Yeah. Well, first off, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I am originally from San Jose, California. I grew up in the Bay Area. I moved up to Oregon for school. And then I moved to Thailand when I was 24. Um, working for an NGO. And that is where I kind of started my photography journey back then, uh, back in 2016. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd started from zero, built a photography business in, in Thailand and um, started teaching, doing a bunch of things in the photography industry. And then I moved out here to Bali. Um, so that's that's basically my story and that's why I'm here. What is your business? What are um, Photography, so I, I shoot client work as well as education. Education is a big part of my business. Um, YouTube, um, there's a lot of different income streams, right, when it comes to this industry. So I try to keep my hands in as many as possible um, to keep things diversified and more secure as well. And why why do you do what you do? What is, what is the passion that lies behind yeah, that? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, and I think that there's a lot of different reasons why I'm drawn to photography. But ultimately for me, I think it always comes down to the aesthetic, right? And the story behind an image. There's something about capturing an image, capturing a moment in time in a beautiful way that just gets me. And it's always been like that. I've always been a very visual person um, ever since I was a kid. So I think that's ultimately what it, what it is for me. And where did the, the education side come into it? We'll talk a bit more about the, the education, the, the, mm -hmm. the way you educate so many people in photography later. Yeah. But where, do you, do you have a teaching background? Is, does that run in the family? Or what drew you to the education side of photography? Yeah, no, no teaching background. It just kind of came about when I was living in Thailand. Um, my buddy was like, man, you're so good. You're good at teaching. I'm like, no, I'm not. And he's like, this is a good opportunity. You should, you should try and teach a course. And of course I had imposter syndrome, right? Everyone has yeah. imposter syndrome when it comes to teaching, but I just did it. I just jumped into it, created a course. It was terrible, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it worked and it, it had, you know, a unique angle. And after teaching two to three courses, I realized like, oh, I'm actually pretty good at this. Like I'm good at simplifying complex topics and um, making them accessible. And uh, that's when it started back in 2017 in Thailand. I taught a course on cafe photography, like how to capture cool photos of coffee. Uh, and that was the, the first one. And then it was an Instagram course. And then, a, you know, a bunch of other kind of smaller courses about photography. But that's when it started back then. And then since then, you know, I've refined my teaching style and uh, learned new techniques. And I put effort into it because I want to make things easy for people to understand. You know, I want right. to put an emphasis on taking these complex topics and making them simple and accessible, so. So what were the lessons you learned, you know, after you did your first course, which you said was not good, mm -hmm. obviously the first time we do everything is, yeah. is generally not good. <laughs> what were the biggest kind of takeaways and what, what did you then kind of put into practice to, to yeah. improve? It's a good question. I think sorting through all the bull right? Like there's a lot of things that you could teach in a course. There's so much that goes into photography business, right? There's a million topics we can discuss in a course. And it's a matter of like refining it into like the most important concepts. And I think I've gotten progressively better at that over time. And also organizing the lessons in a way that's like really easy to understand and really easy to follow. In the beginning, I would just kind of like, you know, just one topic after the next, but now it's more like, how can we make it flow? How can we make everything relate to each other and end on this ultimate goal of, 
you know, whatever that goal is, becoming a better photographer or growing a photography business or something like that. And so do your courses specialize more in the photography, like how to be a better photographer or do they, do they focus more on the business side, how to make a business mm -hmm. out of photography? So it's a mix. Like my older courses, um, they were all more focused on the photography side, the technical, the artistic side of photography, right? Like how to capture cool landscape photos or, you know, creative portrait photography and the entire artistic and technical process behind that. Um, but recently I've gone more into the business side of things um, and I'm teaching a signature course on how to become a professional travel photographer. And that is much more focused right on out now out now <laughs> enrollment is closed Link currently <laughs> it's closed uh, sold out it's closed yeah Thank so you. i'm That's doing amazing. a uh, i'm doing it as a cohort style so i'm going to be going through five weeks with um a set number of students working with them directly how many uh 40 42 wow we wanted to limit this first cohort to two more snuck in at the last moment but we wanted to limit it to 40 so i could just dedicate as much of my time and energy to making sure that they succeed um, and then later on, you know, we'll evergreen it, we'll make it, uh, we'll record it. And this is going to be great because I'm going to learn from what they, you know, I, I can learn from them and they can tell me what their biggest struggles are. And then I can kind of reformat the course and make sure that for future iterations, it encompasses all of those things. Um, I don't think we'll be doing it as a cohort style for the next launch. Um, it's just a lot of energy, a lot of work, but yeah. And if everything's live, but that, that's a great kind of tool to launch into, um, your pa a passive income stream that you Absolutely. don't have to put as much energy into if you yeah. set it all up and then you put it out there and that's it that's the master class ready for you for exactly you and i think like doing it as a cohort first is great because you know i can ensure that i'm providing all the support these students need when they're starting out um answering all their questions you know just being engaged with them and then like i said for future iterations i can include all that information in that in the recorded how course. do you keep the course fresh i mean we'll get on to kind of current trends and things like AI later, mm -hmm. but things change so quickly at the moment, whether you're, whether you're talking social media, yeah. technology, um, AI, mm -hmm. artistic expressions, saturation of the market. How do you, you know, make that course as relevant as, as possible on any given day? It's a really good question. I think as a teacher, as an educator, you have to stay curious. You have to pay attention to what's going on in the industry, right? And it's like, the more you close yourself off to new ideas, the more you're depriving your students. So for me, you know, when I see something, when I see some trend or I'm on YouTube, when I see some video about, you know, some discourse in photography, I pay attention. I like to listen. I like to pay attention to what's what people are talking about, what's going on, um, because that's information I can share with my students, right? So I think it's important to be curious and stay on top of trends as they're coming and yeah just and it, is that something you teach them as well like mm -hmm. here, here's the technical side of growing a business or something but you know the 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 conversations and the the further education that isn't necessarily within the photography yeah. bubble like a, that you teach them that as well and how to how to because my first question to that would be where do you go for that information where do you right. go for you know you've got youtube which mm -hmm. is algorithm based you've got social yeah. media which is algorithm based you've got media outlets uh websites which are yeah. all curated by humans like i mean where where do you go to get reliable and interesting information that is relevant to photography absolutely i think i always tell my my students to be curious right in this industry like be curious about the business side of things be curious about the artistic side of things be curious about everything right and in terms of where to find that information there's a few ways, right? Having a community like here in Bali, yeah. we have a really great community of photographers. We're always having these conversations. I just had a really great conversation yesterday with my buddy, Luke. Um, we're talking about AI and, and social media, and that was a really interesting conversation. And that's a great way to, you know, learn new perspectives. And then YouTube as well. Yeah, YouTube's great. There's a lot of really interesting people on there, I think. And if you're watching photography videos, those will come up. Um, but like, you know, with AI, for example, that's, this is a very new topic. A lot of photographers are creating videos about it and a simple search on YouTube, you know, AI and photography can yield some pretty interesting results with some pretty interesting, uh, angles as well. What is the, um, what is the biggest challenge you've had with students? And I, I wrote down here, what's the shit? 
student you've ever had. But that's probably not the right question to ask. <laughs> yeah. But if I ask that, well, you kind of get what I mean. What you know? Uh -huh. What's the? You know, you must have such a variety of, um, I guess, learning ability and, yeah, and yeah. talent and mm -hmm. insight, and must be so many different uh, artistic expressions that Absolutely. people want to yeah. people want to get out there through photography. What it, I, I guess I should rephrase. What's the kind of the most interesting experience you've had with a student? That's a really good question. Um, you know, in the past, my courses have all been, I haven't been like that present because it was just kind of record and Got post. It. But now that I'm coming into this new iteration where I'm going to be working with my students, I'm going to get to know them a lot more. Um, so the most interesting experience I've had with a student I don't, I don't know if I can answer that right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll move on. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. No problem. Um, as I'm really interested to kind of dive into the market generally, mm -hmm. then it seems, and I don't know whether that's because we're in kind of the photography bubble. So all we kind of see is photography and yeah. whenever we go online, we're kind of in that echo chamber of photography, yeah. but it seems to be... Um, an industry that's more and more popular that more and more people yeah. want to get into it's more accessible for, sure. for a start um how do you make yourself stand out from that crowd and mm -hmm. most specifically your your courses and the education side of it yeah i think right now having a personal brand is incredibly important for any business right not just photography but with the advent of AI and all these things and just the massive amount of content that's being uploaded from smartphones, like you said, photography is very accessible. Having a strong personal brand and identity with your name is one of the best things we can do for our businesses right now. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of things that go along with a personal brand. It's your style, it's your attitude, it's the story that you, that you express behind your images. And I think having a personal brand is very important right now. So why would, why do people, do you think, come to your brand? Why do people come to you? I think a number of reasons. I think I'm, I'm a good educator. I'm confident in my education skills. You know, I'm, I know how to teach. I know how to express topics in a simple way. Um, and I like to keep things chill. You know, I don't want to be too, like, intense. I'm Got that Cali vibe. Yeah. Yeah, I like to support people, you know, make them feel comfortable. And I think that's very important is, like, if you're putting too much pressure on somebody to achieve a certain goal, people can freeze up, you know, and and not get where they want to be because they don't feel supported. So it's a lot of positive reinforcement. Um, that's what I like to do. And it seems to be working. So Rick, if you, how did you learn? You know, what was your process getting into photography? And yeah. Did you did you go to school for it? Did you mm -hmm. learn teach yourself? I was curious, you know, growing up, like my dad had a camera. I played around with it. I got a camera when I was 14, uh, Nikon D3300. And I was like, yeah, just a, just a God, beginner, like $500 okay. camera. And I was, I remember just like doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I was sitting, I used to take long exposures like of my house at night. And I thought digital noise had to do with like the noise in the scene. So I would like hit my shutter, taking a long exposure of my house, like a 30 second 30 second exposure and I would hold my breath because I didn't want to like the breathing sound to introduce noise into the image that's brilliant <laughs> and right? I'm only laughing because I did some stupid stuff yeah as it's well, classic that's, that's amazing yeah but, but yeah you... like being curious like at that age was fun and I learned a lot I think and then I did take a photography class in college and that was great okay. you know learning like some of the more principles of photography but Honestly, most of it, even after that, I didn't, you know, know what depth of field was. Like, there's a lot that I just didn't understand. And I learned all of those things through shooting. Um, and later on, like when I was 24, 25, uh, just diving into the industry and learning as I go. Yeah, it's probably <clears throat> often the best way to learn, right? Yeah. It's just to make mistakes as you go and Absolutely. You know, grow from there. Yeah. Can you tell me anything that you might offer in your course? that i might not know as a photographer is there anything that you know t basically tell me something i don't know there's and there's a lot that i don't know yeah. but <laughs> about about uh business yeah probably business art. would be a, a better one yeah, yeah yeah i think uh that's a really good question something that you might not know put him on the spot a lot already haven't i <laughs> you put me on the spot today 
I think something that a lot of one of the biggest misconceptions in this industry is like, oh, you grow a social media following and then you get clients, right? They just show up and maybe you do a little bit of outreach here and there. But I think one of the best things that we can do for our business when we're starting out as photographers is to go crazy on the outreach, right? Like reach out to as many possible brands as you can in many different niches. And there's techniques to do that, right? We can hire virtual assistants. We can use ChatGPT to help us come up with uh, just different everything brands. Yeah, like, yeah, list of brands in specific industries. So you want to work with a watch company, give me, you know, 50 small to medium sized watch brands with their websites. Boom, you have 50 contacts right there. Then we can outreach to them. Um, and, you know, hopefully one of them will we can score one of them as a client and you can scale this massively, right? Like you, you don't have to limit it to 50. And this is what I did really early on in my career is even when I didn't have a social media following, I reached out to like 500 coffee shops in uh, San Francisco, New York and Portland. And I got a ton of work <laughs> uh, just simply because my name was in front of them. Right. And they are like, Oh yeah, we do need photos. Um, so I think just the idea of outreach is underutilized in mm. this industry. Yeah. Why is that? Because people are lazy or not confident? I think probably, yeah, not confident. Yeah. That's a huge thing yeah. in this industry. People are not confident and confident enough to put themselves out there. And that's something I focus quite heavily on in my courses as well as like, you can do this. Like, you can definitely do this. Um, I didn't think I could teach, you know, back in 2017. And I turned out to be a great teacher. So it's, it's mindset is a huge part of it. And also maybe people feel a little bit intimidated by, you know, reaching like cold emailing somebody like, Hey, my name is Sean. Want to buy my photos? Right. It's never that simple, but I think that's daunting for a lot of people. Um, but if you create a system, it's a lot easier than, than a lot of people think it is. Do you enjoy client work? Do you do much of it? Uh, I, I used to do a lot more. Like it used to be the foundation of my business. It used to be working with a ton of different clients. I probably had four to five clients a week. It was great. I was making great money, but it was a lot of work. It's, it can be stressful at times, but yeah, I enjoy it. It keeps things interesting, you know, and it, and it keeps us on top of the industry and what people want. Um, these days I still do client work, not as much, and it's often in different forms. So I'm doing, you know, YouTube sponsorships. I'm creating videos. I'm doing, um, more campaign-based shoots, which I enjoy. Like I love shooting lookbooks. I love shooting for fashion brands, um, especially like in the adventure wear industry. That's a lot of fun, especially, you know, when you're traveling to these cool places and you get the opportunity to shoot a really cool product in that place. Like that's, that's yeah. dope. And I'm also very drawn to the commercial style of photography. Um, there's a lot of photographers who I like that are commercial photographers and you can just admire the quality of their images um so yeah I, I do like client work to an extent depending on the client <laughs> wow, <so laughs> you're dealing with humans you, yeah, yeah absolutely some's good some bad yeah do do you recommend client work as kind of the first step on that business <laughs> photography business ladder yeah like, because maybe you don't want to work with clients right mm -hmm. you don't want to work with brands as a photographer yeah. you you're more of um you know you, you don't necessarily shoot but, you know, a style that would suit 90% of brands. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's mm -hmm. a, a different style of photography that would is much more niche. And so yeah. maybe that outreach isn't as appropriate. Is, is that co correct? Am I saying that with, yeah. with credence or is, do you talk about that in your course or is it just like, okay, go for brands. It's an easy way in. I think client work is the easiest way for us to get into this industry it's accessible and with like the advent of social media, the amount of content that brands need to be sharing online is obscene, right? Just to stay relevant, they have to be posting so much reels, they need to be posting photos, videos. So that's where we come in and there's a lot of opportunities for us right now. Um, and it's, it's a great way to start and get paid. And then from there, you know, we can build up our socials, we can maybe start a YouTube channel, we can learn about digital marketing and we can implement digital products. We can start teaching. We can do a lot of different things to earn more income outside of client work. But in the beginning, I think client work is, is a really great tool for us to to start out. And just going back to the, the teaching side of it, and we'll probably talk about YouTube later as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
what makes you a good teacher you know, if, if if someone wanted to go into i'm very interested in the education side mm -hmm. i'd much ra i'd much rather educate than work with brands if it was a choice yeah, if it was yeah. one or the other what makes you a good teacher you know one thing would you say that you've that is either innate to you or that you've learned mm -hmm. that makes you a good, a good educator i think um yeah i think I, I mentioned this earlier but it's it's taking all of this information that you find that you learn because you're curious right a good teacher's curious and it's compiling it all into an easy to follow formula and right. an easy and it's easy to understand easy to implement and also um engaging as well i think it's important to be engaging and engage your students get them interacting with you and that's something i'm doing in in this new cohort of finding freedom that's my new signature course is we're doing weekly projects we're doing weekly mock briefs so i'm going to have students go out and like cool. pretend that they're working with us with a client we have like these these fake briefs that you know have all these different deliverables and like style um, mood boards and stuff and uh, that's going to get them out in the field interacting engaging and i think that's really important for for teaching you mentioned style there how important is that for a photographer or because i you know i put this out there sometimes mm -hmm. and I, I think a you know a basic style is important to be identifiable but other people disagree with me mm -hmm. you don't need it you need to be versatile you need to be able to do loads of stuff mm -hmm. and, and i know your style and you know is about emotion and storytelling mm -hmm. which you which you talk about being the the pillars of your content yeah. is what do you tell your students when it comes to style and finding your kind of your voice as it were yeah so i think eventually later down the line photographers can and you know maybe should at a certain level at a high level really niche down into a specific kind of area of photography whether that's you know landscape photography fashion photography or whatnot and and with that niche down comes like a specific style right but in the beginning, I think one of the most important things about being a photographer, especially a travel photographer, is being multifaceted, right? It's being able to shoot portraits, landscapes, products, hotels, because travel that's what we do as travel photographers, right? We're not just like going out and shooting banger landscapes. As much as, <laughs> as cool as that would be, like realistically, that doesn't pay the bills. So we need to be shooting a lot of different things. So I tell my students like, be curious, shoot whatever the hell you want, you know, whatever inspires you shoot that we can build separate portfolios. Yeah. And then just show that to the client. That's it. That it's relevant to. Right. So yeah. it's like, you want to shoot, you want to work for a hotel. You don't have to only shoot hotels. You better not be just shooting hotels, but when you reach out to a hotel, show them your hotel work. Um, if you want to shoot for a restaurant, show them your restaurant work. So I think in the beginning, it's important to shoot a lot of different things. Shooting different subject matter doesn't mean you can't have one style though, right? Like you can shoot a lot of different things and still have a consistent style. And I think a lot of that comes into the way you utilize light. Um, your editing style is is very important for that. Um, yeah, and I think yeah. what, you, what you, further down the line, what you're trying to say as a photographer, as an artist, right? Mm -hmm. There's a difference between maybe being a photographer for a client and you know working across many portfolios yeah to being an artist with a voice and yes. i think people yes. can get confused with style and voice mm -hmm. style i think is just aesthetics aesthetics yeah voice yeah. is you know what are you what are you trying to make out of this mm -hmm. right what is what is the deep meaning behind a collection of images or your journey as a photographer right there's so yeah, many it's yeah. so complex and that's where the beauty of it comes in 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 my mind and that's where really the skill comes into it absolutely um, so yeah I, I i think there's kind of too much confusion over mm -hmm. that but it's an interesting and it's an interesting topic brings me on to a subject that um we'll probably need a beer for but mm. ai <clears throat> yeah um i just i just released a video of, of my thoughts on it on youtube and mm. um that doesn't even cover the start of it i don't think and i'd love to hear yeah just generally you know your thoughts yeah. on ai both for I guess the humanity, but more specifically, uh, you know, our industry in, in photography. Yeah. It's, it's a massive topic, right? Like yeah. I've been trying to organize my thoughts about AI and I just, <laughs> I yeah. haven't been able to like, I'm like, what are some themes that I can narrow this down to? And I think the approach that I'm taking to AI is 
is what I mentioned earlier is just like being curious about it. I think if we, if we deny the significance of this, especially as photographers and we're like, yeah, like AI, like, you know, it's going to ruin our industry. We're going to get left behind. You know, we have to stay on top of these trends. We have to pay attention to what's going on. So I think AI is like really interesting. I think there's a lot of opportunity with photographers. At least that's how I'm trying to look at it. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how I can use it and implement it into my photography business and into the artistic side of photography um, to, you know, stay on top of what's going on. So that's kind of my take on it. And it's big, you know, there's, there's so many different platforms coming out, whether it's text-based, image-based, right? That's the one everyone's concerned about is, you know, mid journey. It's incredible. Like I play around with mid journey all the time and there's, there's so much capability with that. And but at the end of the day, I think the thing that's going to separate photography from AI is the fact that photography is is real, or at least as close to real as possible, right? Like, it's still going through an image sensor. It's every it's always going to be biased to some degree, but I think it's it's a realistic depiction of real life, and AI is not, and it will never be, right? So, photography will always have its place. It just might look a little bit different and the next few years i think depends how you define real life i mean i I've, I've had this debate with many people before mm. kind of more old school people who don't even believe in editing photos and if you if they do it's like dodge and burn only um yeah, yeah. whereas i take the view it's like well that's the artistic creation side yeah of it. and yeah it's yeah. it's you can okay structurally change a photo but if that's your artistic expression and that's the way you want to put a piece of art out there then who are we to say that that's right or wrong right, right. and um and I, that like that's also like there's there's a flaw in that thinking as well like not editing your photos because an image sensor is editing your photo exactly so it's like exactly yeah yeah as soon as you turn that camera on especially if it's a digital mm -hmm. photo you are editing you're yeah. editing even if you've got a box and you just but you're editing what you see, right? Mm, yeah. You know, absolutely. you're not, you're choosing not to see that part. You're choosing not to see that part or whatever. Yeah. You're choosing to shoot a specific time because of the light. You know, yeah. you are edit. you are editing it mm -hmm. before you even press, press the shot button. So, I mean, that's a different discussion altogether, but yeah. I, how, how will you even talk about opportunities with AI? What, what do you see those opportunities to be? Yeah. Well, right now I'm utilizing chat. GPT a lot in my business, the business side of things, right? Yeah. Like we have to, it's, it's super powerful. Writing briefs, coming up with ideas, researching brands. We can use chat GPT for so many different things. Just to explain to some people may not know what chat GPT is yet. I mean, I'm sure they do, but just in case explain. Yeah. explain. It's, uh, it's a text-based AI engine. Um, you basically feed it prompts and it gives you responses based on everything that's on the internet, right? So. It's not perfect. Like I wouldn't use it for writing like a personalized email template, but it's good. And it gives us a good starting point to build off of. And it's great for coming up with ideas as well. Do you get the paid version, chat GPT-4? I just have the, the, the free version. The free right version, now. yeah. yeah. The, the biggest limitation I see with chat GPT, and there are the others that don't have this limitation, but most of the data sources, all of the data sources is 2021 and, and before. So, I think people can are confusing at the moment chat GPT with like Google and search engines. Mm. Like, no, don't use it for a search engine because mm -hmm. A, it's probably not going to be accurate and it's all, yeah. use Google yeah, or use a search yeah. engine, right? But um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of ways that I can use AI to just answer any question that anyone, just even wake up in the morning and, and my wife will ask me something, I'll just put a yeah. put a phone in her face and just yeah that's the answer <laughs> just so i don't have to talk or think or do anything <laughs> which is the danger right it's yeah. if yeah. you end up relying on it too much i guess it can detract from intelligence or yeah, yeah. or effort or motivation or drive so it's mm. um it's a balancing act isn't it yeah it is a balancing act is it something you think you're going to introduce into the education side of it mid-journey yeah. and how you can use that mm -hmm. to I guess be a better photographer. So I'm still I'm still trying to figure out like how it's going to massively impact the artistic side of photography. Like for us as photographers, how can we use AI to improve our images, right? Like AI editing is 
here. It's been here. Yep. We've, we've been using it for a while now, yep. but it's getting better. Luminar AI oh my is God. something that I'm really curious about playing with a little bit more. Um, I have it downloaded. I haven't, but I haven't played with it too much. But we have, you know, these new Lightroom features. They're awesome. Like the new AI editing tools. Yeah, um, those, those new like masking tools that came out last year. Yeah, that, yeah. I mean, takes so much of the the effort, it's the incredible, precision. Man. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I love it. It speeds up my workflow Does. so much. I can be so much more precise. But I think, but I think we're at this turning point now where like things are still just starting to happen with AI and photography. Obviously, with Mid Journey, like you can like create a photo. But in terms of like utilizing AI for our photography, is just getting started. And I'm really curious to see what's going to happen in the next few years, um, and how those two are going to mesh together really well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's it's exciting. It's technology we have to embrace it and i'm curious to see where things are going to go do you think it will replace certain genres of photography yeah i think it's going to greatly impact the industry i think it's going to impact the industry at especially at a lower level you know where you know brands they might not want to have to pay you know five six grand to get photos of their coffee shop or something like that like yeah. that's not sustainable Whereas they could create, you know, an AI rendering of the interior of their menu um, and save a bunch of money and it will look real. But I think at a certain level, photography will never be replaced, right? These high level brands that want to depict things realistically will still hire photographers, right? Like, because it comes back to the idea of like realism. I think that's going to become something that's very important. For brands as ai gets more important uh, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger realism is going to be like this very important topic for the the entire world right i think that's why photography is going to stay stick around for a very long time why do you think realism matters i think realism matters because it's authentic and authenticity is very important on on online Right. Especially I feel like it's gotten more and more important over time. Um, and as all of this content is being uploaded on the Internet, thanks to AI, right, like the amount of text being generated, the amount of you know blog posts and videos that were written by AI scripts are being generated and flooding into this social media uh, you know marketplace. Authenticity is what's going to allow brands and businesses and, and people to stand out because it's a real human, right? It's, it's a real coming from a real human being. Do you think there are, what do you think of the legal implications that we haven't seen yet? Mm -hmm. Certainly with image generation where you've got rights issues, authenticity issues, you know, I'd like to see in yeah. the future, maybe a way that I, I think of it like the, Instagram check mark or the Twitter check marks. Mm -hmm. Like if you see a photo and it's got a little check mark, it means it's authentic or it's been through a process that has authenticated it as real. However, that's defined. I mean, yeah. a real person, should we yeah. say, if it's a person or a real place or a real person that's taking it. I mean, there are so many different parts of an image that you could say is real and, and isn't. Mm. Um, but I guess, you know, the two biggest things was the subject is a real subject and the 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 generation of that image is by a real human. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm in, interested to kind of figure out how the the legal side of it is going to work because at the moment it's just free fall. It's so great. Which is like, yeah. just, that scares me. Yeah. Because where is Mid Journey getting the, I mean, it's getting, getting image, it's getting uh, cues and image, parts yeah. of images from, people's images from yeah. stock images Artists. and yeah from google or yeah. from people who've put i don't know exactly where it gets it from do you know i don't i'm, I'm not sure either i think i think it just scrapes like the internet <laughs> but i'm it's not really sure scary, like, the fight the entire fucking internet in you know 30 seconds and like what are your fears with it what are you know it, do you have any fears with the introduction of ai yeah yeah i think a lot of photographers fear it right now is like it's never been easier to create something incredibly aesthetic, right? Like you can go on a mid journey and make a dope photo in two minutes. And that's scary. You know, it's, 
it is certainly going to replace certain industries in you know photography in the photography industry like i said earlier and uh that's definitely scary what do you see those industries being or the, the sectors of the photography industry being that's going to replace i think it's going to have implications across the entire industry but i think that there's certain you know there's certain businesses clients brands whatever you want to call them that are still going to really want to express like this realism and authenticity right like i said like wedding photos for example you're not going to ai generate wedding photos it's not well first off there's there might not be any like other photos to pull from yeah so so it can't generate those images then in a real way but also like the beauty of a photograph is, is it's like an accurate depiction of a moment in time and ai is not right and that is one of the things that that's one of like the core concepts of photography is like this happened, right? And we captured that moment in time. And there's certain things that that is incredibly important, you know, special events, journalism. Um, and I think travel photography as well. It's like, this is a real place. Yeah, it's beautiful, but there's a story behind it as well, right? So I think that side of photography will allow it to you know, power through this massive AI interruption. Um, but I think it will have, it will, you know, take over a lot of different other parts of the photography industry. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to be a diminished industry. Mm. Or there are some um, sectors of the industry, like you said, um, food photography, uh, mm. product photography. Surely yeah. that's... yeah. You know, you, you're thinking about where where does the demand come from, right? The demand comes from businesses. You know, put put the art aside, and just the the aesthetics of an image, and you know what with social media and the 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 the, the demand for images and content that is ever growing for businesses, they're going to want a quicker and cheaper solution. The majority of businesses, right? Yeah, there are going to be, uh, you know, the 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 higher echelons of businesses yeah. that want authenticity mm. and that want a story and that want you know the 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 depth of an image yeah to go with whatever they're trying to sell or say yeah but yeah i, I worry i think photography will become more of a, a cottage industry where it's a little bit more it's a bit like i think of it like film photography today i was just gonna say that where yeah. it's like it still has such an artistic value yeah and yeah. it's such an amazing craft but it's not you know, it's not mass it's produced. Not it it's not, yeah, it's not commercialized yeah. as what it used to be, which I think is, you know, depending on where you sit in the photography world, I think that's, that's kind of a nice thing to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, go, going on into social media, I think one of the problems with photography today, problems is probably the wrong word. One of the, the difficulties is certainly if you're starting out and you probably talk about this in the course, but it's so saturated, right? yeah. especially yeah. social media. You know, how do you grow on social media these days? It's mm. more difficult than it was back in 2017, 18. Yeah. Even before that. Mm -hmm. um, so having so many photographers and maybe AI will be a bit of a, um, the first word that came to mind was chemotherapy. Probably one word, a bit of chemotherapy for photography. You know, it will get, get rid of some of the, the low lying, the low hanging fruit. Mm. Maybe, I don't know. That's just my, and I, I think that's maybe a good thing. Um, but yeah, social media is uh, is going to be a biggest benefit of AI, I think. I mean, it's already used as AI. I mean, what yeah. am I talking about? But I mean, the art artistic side of it. Um, you know, I, even I'm thinking about just starting a new social media channel that yeah. is just AI images because that yeah. the the art of it really interests me. Yeah. Not the reality or the authenticity of it. And And what I think we shouldn't do is bundle it together with photography. Right. Like it's not, it's nothing to do with photography. Mm. Just because it's a visual format doesn't mean it's anything to do with photography. True, true. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. We all kind of bundle it in with, oh, how's it going to affect photography? It's nothing to do with photography. <laughs> yeah, businesses will point. use it to generate images. Yeah. And and unfortunately, jobs will be lost or people mm -hmm. will have to adapt. But like, it's a, just a new art form. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. It's like, exciting. Brace it. Try it's, it out. It's fucking cool. Man. It's fun. Yeah, I love Mid Journey. Like, it's so cool. Uh, uh, you can even use it to generate mood boards too, you know? Yeah, like, that's another great yeah. tool of it, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're in like, 
well, any type of mood, mood board, but yeah, anything like yeah, fashion anything. photography is a great example. Yeah, because you, know, you have really easy prompts for that. Like I want a you know a lady in a blue dress wearing gold mm -hmm. or whatever. Some um, basic stylistic traits that you, exactly. you are thinking. Yeah. What's the best image you've created so far in mid-journey? Anything you're proud of? You go like, oh yeah, that's legit. Uh, I've only played with it a little bit. And I, okay. I, when I was really playing with it, it was early, It was one of the earlier versions. So it wasn't where it is now. Um, but I created some cool images of like this. I had, I used to listen to a lot of like lo-fi when I was working. Um, and I always love the the image on the YouTube videos in the lo-fi videos. They're like really vibey. It's like a, it's like a you know 3D rendering of a, of a bedroom in like Hong Kong at night. And there's like a window and there's like the city's going on outside. And it's like a really vibey study session or something like that. Right. And so I was like, I fucking love that stuff, man. Like it's there's so much mood and emotion and story. Yeah. So I created these images of like this this girl like working in her you know small little flat with the window open and the city kind of going on behind her and it was like moody and, and emotional and very dark and blue like blue hour and cool yeah it's pretty cool yeah it's uh it's great it's great to experiment and get inspired i mean mm. i i've played mm. quite a lot with it um I, I you know i want to do more with it but i think some of the stuff i've generated and i've gone you know, I would never have thought of that or I've never yeah. thought of that yeah. look or what it can just, what it can generate just blows my mind. And what blows my mind even more and going back to kind of the, what, how we started this conversation, the speed of it is, is scary, but I don't it's know why crazy, it's scary. Man. It's yeah. insane. Like, where are we going to be in a year, let alone 10 years? <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know what can answer that question. Even just but, like three months ago. We yeah. were on a different version of Mid Journey, yeah. and like, like it's got two so different much versions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. It's nuts. Uh, how how do you think um, how do you think it plays into social media, and does it? I mean, do you think it can enhance someone's profile? Do you think people can use that for growth? Yeah, I mean. In terms of, I think there's like two sides of it. There's AI tools that we can use to make our, you know, social media creation process more streamlined, more efficient. And then there's the actual like content that can be AI generated, right? That might be writing scripts. That might be the actual images, like creating images and, you know, posting those if that fits within your niche on social media. But how I'm utilizing it right now is, is the... The workflow the efficiency side of things right like chat gpt coming up with ideas you can use um there's like apps like one's called captions where you upload your short form video and it automatically generates captions oh for God. you and they look sick and you can customize them and stuff and highlight certain words um so i think it's it's going to help us become more efficient in putting out more content for sure what do you think of social media generally i think it's necessary it's a necessary evil. I think, and I don't, I don't know if I really want to say evil. You know, I think the thing about being an artist, I think there's the, the two most important things is creating great work and getting that work seen, right? Sharing that work. And the medium in which we share that work is constantly changing and it will always be changing. In the past, Artists showed their work in galleries. They hustled. They went out. They gave their business cards. They're like, "Hey, can can I get into your gallery?" Like back in the old days, right? Or they stood on a on a corner, and they sold their images and they tried to get their images seen, maybe in a newspaper. But now it's social media. That is our medium, in which we can best get our work seen. And there's nothing out there that that's better than that, right? So we have to play the game. We have to invest ourselves in social media and get our work seen because it doesn't matter if you're creating sick work if no one sees it right so i think it's something that is absolutely necessary for creatives does it matter if people see it or not it depends right if you want to make a living yes yeah if you don't care about that no absolutely not so what do you teach your students about social media what are, what are the kind of big lessons that you you teach people with i don't know growth uh yeah you know yeah. your por portfolio kind of thing you know you'd see instagram as more of a 
portfolio mm -hmm. based app or you know it's both you know like when i'm when i'm teaching my students like how to get clients in the beginning i think it's important to just build out an instagram it doesn't have to be big it doesn't have to grow but it does serve as a portfolio yep. absolutely it shows it serves as a portfolio it serves as social proof that you're a real person shows what you're about and then beyond that you know growing that can help us get a lot more work and and also help us sell more products um you mentioned earlier that you think it's harder to grow on social media now than it was back in 2018 but i actually disagree i think it's much easier to grow now okay because of the virality of content right like short form videos can fucking explode and you can get so many followers like that right and it's if you're posting consistently i think it's you can grow incredibly fast right now yeah interesting i mean it's it depends how flexible you are with what you would you know if you're still image yeah, yeah. photographer right mm. back in 2017 right uh, but you you've got to be good like, yeah you know let's let's take that as a as a given if you're a good photographer you post good images you you're, you're probably gonna grow yeah right back back then you post good images now you're not gonna grow i just don't yep. believe I that agree. you are yeah so then yes you have to you have to adapt but that kind of can mean that you dilute your your voice or your you know really what you want to do and it t it saps energy from yeah from really what you want to do i don't want to do video i know but i know that this is a tool that's going to help me do more of what i want to do so you it's just like to. playing that yeah. long game um so yeah i i do I, I know what you mean and maybe i didn't phrase it correctly but i think you have to think much more strategically mm -hmm. about social media than maybe you used to but oh, i yeah, wasn't I in social media that. six years ago so i i yeah. i'd be a wrong guy to to really say that that's just a, an opinion based off nothing but actually a, a few people i know um that grew so much so quickly back five years ago mm -hmm. and now not so much right yeah i mean I would, I would definitely agree with that like just pure photography back in the day it was much easier yeah but photography is not enough anymore you know and no. you, you mentioned video and that's something i teach my students is like we got to learn video. We have to learn video. You don't have to learn it at a super high level, but you should be able to create short form videos for yourself, possibly for clients. And also, you know, video is so important for building a personal brand, having a YouTube channel. We can share so many ideas and that can, you know, we can attract sponsors through that. We can make videos you know showing how we use our products that we're selling on our website whether it's like presets guidebooks whatever like marketing videos for ourselves right so there's so many avenues in which we can use video um i think it's very important for photographers to learn and all the cameras can do it these days yeah. right all the all the mirrorless cameras can shoot yeah. great video so yeah. apart from the hasselblad <laughs> so when it when it comes to social media and i i I do kind of think it's a necessary evil. Mm. I I think there is, I think the the net result of social media is maybe not a good one. Mm. Yeah. As photographers, I think it's different because I think the the net result is beneficial because most of the times photographers we're like you said we're using it as a as a portal to share our art, yeah. which and. The community is generally very spirited. It's encouraging people, you know, engage. It's, mm -hmm. it's more of an artistic um, sharing, right? It's, yeah. which I think is just amazing. It's like, cool. Yeah. Social media in general. I mean, I, I did a, um, I did a bit of a competitor analysis a couple of years ago. Oh, it was a, a year ago. And I set up a dummy account and uh, I just thought, okay, what is the world interested in? You know, that, so the dummy account was fresh like it didn't follow anyone no one following it zero 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 right? yeah. no posts or anything so i was like what is the algorithm going to churn out to me and so i was just scrolling for hours hours on for days just making notes like okay you know how can i adapt my output not my photography just my what i'm going to put out there how am i going to adapt that in order to enable more growth and more, more of an audience um and what I found what'd you get? <laughs> just disturbing. Trash content. Trash. Yeah. So literally, I think it came into like 45% of what I saw with it. I mean, all of it videos. 45% of what I saw was 
almost fully naked women yeah. um like doing something sexual not like explicit sexually not porn but like maybe they're eating a banana and they're like yeah. you know looking seductively yeah. at the camera with barely anything on but that was like almost half of what i saw yeah you know and as a and as a guy like okay you know that's just you know i don't mind looking at yeah. half naked women but that's not what i'm interested mm -hmm. in and i'm amazed that the general population uh, uh that's all they want to see on on yeah. on a social media i mean there's places Sex sells. It, it does always, it always will so the other thing is what else sells violence and so it's like a third 30 odd percent of what i i saw were fights car crashes just general like shocking yeah. stuff but yeah. kind of that morbid fascination thing if you boil it down it's like the most core things of being a human yeah right like sex yeah. morbid curiosity money yeah. food yeah you know, like it's survival survival stuff. yeah yeah so yeah that was like 80 percent of of instagram so like, well, how am i how am i meant to compete with this yeah you know, do i just throw my life out there and just see what sticks yeah do i you know think about this in a completely different way do i just do not do photography but i i i make it more personal so i get why i'm saying this is um I get disheartened and I'm sure uh, like a lot of stu of your students or people studying photography, it's daunting, right? It is. Yeah. It's really daunting. Do you, have you ever been in that position and, and do you put everything out there or is there like some images some content that you will never share and that you kind of keep kind of in a private setting? Yeah, I would, I would say I probably share like 5% of my photos, honestly. Wow. I just share the best of the best there's so many photos that I shoot that, you know, mean a lot to me that I, that I keep to myself or, you know, I, I don't share them on the main stage just with family and friends. And one of the things I started doing was actually putting together a, a photo yearbook with all okay. of my favorite photos. And I'm, when I'm building this, this yearbook, I'm not thinking about anybody else. I'm thinking about myself and what I like. Right. So it's for 2021, 2022, I put together, a book it's like you know 90 pages and there's like 250 photos and it's 250 of my favorite photos that i shot with my iphone that i shot with my fuji that i shot with my you know my sony and it's all kinds of things it's banger landscapes but it's also small moments that mean something to me that might not mean something to anybody else you know it's it's just a documentation of my entire year through photos and all the photos that are in that book mean something to me and they're beautiful as well. Like there's, I have, uh, you know, a standard of, of beauty that I put in that book. I don't just put snapshots. It has to be somewhat aesthetic and I love it. It's one of the best things I've ever done. And I can take that book. And when someone comes over and be like, Hey, here's my 2021 yearbook, check it out. And people love it, man. And it's, it's for me, it's for my family, it's for my friends. And at the end of the book, I have like a little write up, a little, a uh, little recap of the year talking about some of the themes of that year um, from a personal perspective, you know? This is some of the stuff that happened. This is my life. These are my friends. Kind of like a visual diary almost. Yeah, like a visual diary. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I, awesome. That sounds awesome. And I I do something similar. I definitely, I don't do that. I'd love to. It's, it's a great idea. Um, I guess it's, it's, oh, it's refreshing to hear for a start. Mo most people I talk to in the photography space, they're just glued to their phone right they're glued to social media they're glued to like yeah, yeah i need to either see what someone else is doing or i need someone else to see what i'm doing mm -hmm. and they they don't necessarily have the or from what i can see they don't necessarily have that introspection and yeah. that that's really where the beauty comes in is that that expression that is an expression of art that is just for the sake of the art itself mm -hmm. not yeah. for the sake of a anyone else or a media platform or whatever right it is just for you or for who you care about the most yeah, and yeah. i think that's has a beauty in itself and absolutely man. It's the most meaningful the most meaningful images i've i've ever taken i probably haven't shared yeah or i have but they're with my wife and, mm -hmm. and maybe close friends yeah Be and I, that for me makes it i don't know more more precious yeah and more more powerful so. for sure i mean if you look you know in, in 50 years when we're old we're, we're dying <laughs> What's what's gonna matter? <laughs> Hope I'm not dying at fifty. No, I mean oh, in, in fifty, 50 years, years fifty yeah, years yeah, from yeah. now. Well, yeah. I guess so I'll you'll be, be like seventy. 
Hopefully, I'll still be, you know, still pumping along, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> Deadlifting 200. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the the social media is not going to mean shit. Like, the medium in which we share might not be even be social media. It most likely won't be. It's going to be some completely different technology that we haven't seen yet. But a printed photo, right, that we oh. have in front of us will last forever. Yeah. And it's going to be there until the day we die. And it's going to mean something yeah. to us. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important to share as much as you can for the sake of business, for the sake of, you know, finding success as a photographer, but also pay attention to the photos that aren't, you know, Insta worthy and, and compile those and put them somewhere, print them. I think printing is one of the best things we can do. I love it. Seeing your work. You have all, you have all those photo books downstairs. I love that. Like I have photo books at home too. And there's something about sitting in a room and looking at images on paper and the way the light hits the paper and oh. it, you know it changes and it's just a whole mood it and the brings the story of a book the, the story exactly the yeah. way it's the way it's laid out and the setting in which you read that book and it's such a so much more of a vibe right and i love printing my work and uh i love doing this this yearly photo book yeah that's a great idea yeah i've started doing something similar with film because mm. film i find um I don't know. It's just more personal. I find yeah, it more yeah, personal. Yeah. I don't know. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, I fucking love film. So I just, we've, we've, I, I've got a Polaroid, which I've had for years, but I've only really started like taking it everywhere now. Yeah. And even if it's just one Polaroid I get love over that. the space of a month, like even whatever it is, mm-hmm. just, but it's a memory. It's a, it's a moment, which is really the essence. Like yeah. Talk about yeah. the essence of photography. And, and I totally agree with you. That is, where that won't change that will last forever mm-hmm. and um whereas social media won't or it'd be different if, it, if it's different. still around it'd be different yeah and so um and you don't own that remember as well like, yeah you don't own it meta does mm-hmm. um, so anyway yeah interesting yeah talk to me about youtube because um i've just started my journey on youtube and have no idea what i'm doing but i enjoy it yeah um how much of YouTube plays into your kind of business portfolio and how much attention do you, do you give it? Yeah. YouTube is man. YouTube is huge. Like there's so much yeah. potential there. And, um, I've, you know, played around with YouTube over the years. I think I have like 50, 60 videos on there over the course of like, you know, six years. And, um, it's something that's very hard to stay consistent in because it's a lot of work, you know, posting every yeah. week and, there's a standard of quality that a lot of us photographers hold ourselves to. And it's hard to, you know, match that level of yeah. quality week after week. But I've had, you know, a, a, just a simple case study. Like I had a video that I put out back in 2020 about Aperture, super simple. And in that video, I just, you know, discussed like what Aperture means, what it does. It's gotten 1.4 million views, you know, and wow. I had a free lead magnet in that video where I'm, you know, here's a free preset pack to download. And that was linked up to a funnel. And that has made me so much money over the last, you know, two years, three wow. years now. And in, that's the beauty of YouTube is like, if you have one video go off and it's, you know, you have the right sponsor, you have the right, ideally your own product that you're selling, um, that can generate so much income over the next few years. And so I think YouTube is incredibly powerful and it doesn't have to be as complicated as people think it is. Quantity is is more important than you, your videos should still be quality, but they don't need to be, you know, perf- perfect. Like they don't have to be shot perfectly, super beautifully. It's it's more about the themes, the messages um, and your personality. It's the most important thing on YouTube. So how important are sponsors? I mean, that's really the, the biggest driver in, in revenue, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think sponsors are a huge part of, of the game, especially as you get bigger, like sponsors pay well. So how um, do you get them? Uh, a lot of the time they reach out to you. Do they? Yeah. Yeah, I get sponsors reaching out to me all the time. For Can YouTube. I have some of them, please? Yeah, I'll send you some, <laughs> I'll send you some contacts. Like once great. you get to a certain level, you know, they just start reaching out. So that's the chicken and egg situation, right? It's like, I need to grow, I need to, I need to grow a channel. I, so, you know, you need to do the, the, the basic the foundation Mm of of growing that channel to a certain point where it kind of takes care of itself or at least the monetization of it takes care of itself because then you start getting sponsors so yeah what is that level is there a you know would you say you know if a student of yours wants to start a youtube channel like okay get to ten thousand subscribers and you know you'll be set with or you should start then getting 
sponsors being attracted. Yeah. I don't even think like the subscriber count has all that much to do with it. Okay. Like subscribers really don't mean all that much on YouTube anymore. Um, you probably subscribe to a thousand channels and don't ever see the videos, right? Yeah, true. Uh, it's, it's view count. It's consistency. Um, the more your content is being seen, the more it's also being seen by potential brands, right? Um, so even though I don't share on YouTube all that much, I still have so many people reaching out to me, gear companies reaching out to me, trying to market on my channel, willing to pay me, you know, a few thousand dollars per video just to, you know, talk about their filters Jesus. or their audio equipment. Um, and it's not like that on Instagram. Like yeah. YouTube, YouTube is a much better medium for platforms to sell, for brands to sell yeah. um, their, their, you know, products on. So the sponsors on YouTube are all over and they're, they're plentiful. Um, but that's only one way we can monetize, right? Like I said earlier, having our own products is massive and there's so much potential there, whether it's a course, whether it's presets, whether it's a software or a guidebook or anything, right? Who do you follow on YouTube? Who's, who's your biggest inspiration when it comes to either YouTube or photographers in general? Um, Ali Abdal. Oh yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. His YouTube course is incredible. Mm -hmm. He's, I just really love his content. It's the, the vibe, uh, as well as, you know, the actual content itself. It's great. Like he's sharing new ideas. Um, he's great. I'm a huge Ali Abdal fan. Uh, he's probably one of the biggest ones that I follow. Um, there's, uh, Willem Verbeek is a film photographer, yep. big fan. I know him. And a lot of the other film photographers as well, um, Vulandis, amazing work. He shoots film, uh, I forget where he is in the US, but his work is stunning, man. And he's cool and he you know, he shares interesting perspectives. He shoots with a lot of cool cameras. Huge fan of the channel. Cool, I'm gonna check it yeah. out, I don't, don't know him. Yeah. Film. Film, film. mostly film, yeah, all, all film. All right, yeah. cool. Um, it's been a wonderful conversation. I'm gonna end yeah. with a couple of probably the more difficult questions, but interesting. <laughs> Bring them on. Um, tell us something that people don't know about you and that they can't find online on any of your, your platforms. Um, Put him on the spot again. <laughs> yeah, for real, man. Got to provide some value. Uh, a, a story, or something that happened in my life. Sure. Either one. Either one. When I uh, when I graduated from graduate school, I was desperate to travel, and I had done Southeast Asia, but I wanted to go somewhere like in hardcore. I was like, I want to jump into this, do two months, like in a weird place. And I went to China, and I'm, okay. I don't mean to say like China is a weird place. It's a very foreign place. Yeah. And I did two months solo backpacking through this country, and there's so many uh, <laughs> uncomfortable moments, crazy stories, but. One of the best days of my life, I decided to hike the abandoned section of the Great Wall of China. Okay. And there's like these remodeled sections where you can go and it's, you know, it's nice. And yeah. All the tourists go there. But I was like, oh, fuck that. I want to get like raw. I want to see this thing, when, like how it was built 600 years ago or whatever. Yeah. The, or the original. The original. Building blocks. Yeah. So I, I found all these like old blog posts. They were like seven years old about this place called Gianco where you could go and you could climb the Great Wall and it's illegal and there's, you know, all this stuff. And all the posts were like, like I said, super outdated. So I didn't know if it was accurate. I woke up at like 4 a.m., took a bus, took a taxi to like this tiny little town on the base of the Great Wall, hiked up. And for seven to eight hours, I walked, I hiked the abandoned section of the Great Wall of China by myself. There was no one up there. There's all these signs saying this is illegal. You can't be here. And I, was, wow. I turned off. I got a text from the Chinese government. I turned off my phone. I was, like, and um, yeah, I hiked this incredible world heritage site alone, and it was stunning, man. Uh, and I didn't know what I was doing with photography. I took, you know, a couple hundred photos, but um, I lost all the photos. No. Yeah, except I have like a few of the JPEGs on ah. Instagram. And one of the photo, one of the compositions that I got is to this day, like one of the most unique, beautiful compositions I've ever seen. And I've tried to play around with the JPEG file and it's just, mm, it's, it's brutal. It's not easy to edit, but um, 
that's a story that I haven't really talked all that much about. Lesson learned. Story, lesson guess. learned. Well, wait, wait, how did you lose the photos? Not being organized with my data. Okay. Because okay. I was new. Okay. You know, I, and I just didn't have everything organized. And I think I formatted the wrong hard drive or something. And yeah. Poof. Gone. Oh, man. Tried to That's, recover them. And... Yeah, I was talking to you earlier off, off camera, but um, I always get scared when I format. format. Even though I know 100%, yeah. like I've got three backups. Yeah. But just pressing that format it's is terrifying. Like, <laughs> it's terrifying. Um, especially if you've been through an experience like that, right? Yeah. But I, I know a photographer, I, won't, I definitely won't name him, but he's a good friend of ours. Um, he went shooting the other week, shot everything JPEG. Oh, um, yeah. Got beautiful <laughs> shots. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. shots for just JPEGs. And JPEGs. It, so it still happens. And he's a very successful very professional successful. photographer. Yeah. Um, so it still happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess processes and systems help with that. For sure. Um, and being in the correct host space. But interesting. So, yeah. Interesting. Last question. And this is a, this is a kind of a series of kind of uh, conversation cuts. Um, mm. But I picked, luckily picked one out that was the same as usually a kind of tradition. We get each guest to write out a question for the next guest without knowing. Okay. You actually okay. know who the next guest is, which is a bit annoying, but you write a question for the next guest for, for them to, f to answer. Okay. Um, and this one I picked out was very, very similar to, to, the previous guest and what, what they asked. So the question is, what are you clear about now that one year ago you didn't know? Yeah, that's a really tough question. I think one thing I've learned in the past year, you know, I had some, some difficult personal things that happened to me in the last year and I realized how much it affected my work, my creativity. And I think you know, the topic of, of mental health and mindset is so incredibly important in this industry. Being mentally healthy allows us to, thr to thrive creatively and from a business perspective as well. And I felt the full brunt of that when I was in, you know, a state of, of poor mental health. I was really struggling for a few months and it greatly impacted me and I couldn't work, you know, and now that I've climbed out of it and I feel like myself again and I feel creative again, I can look back and say, wow, like it is so incredibly important if, if you're working as a creative or you have your own business to, to stay on top of yourself, to stay on top of your mental health, to be aware of what you're feeling, um, to be mentally healthy, but physically healthy as well. And these are things that now I value greatly, you know? I try hard to take care of myself as much as I possibly can from, from a mental health, perspe mental health perspective. Otherwise, my work suffers. So it's okay to take that day off, even if you have stuff going on. Like, you need to look after yourself. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to, to make it in this industry. Were you depressed? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I've struggled with depression throughout my entire life ever yeah. since I lost my dad at a very young age very suddenly and since then it's kind of been a battle you know it goes back and forth generally my mental health is is really good um uh, but there's periods where you yeah. know something triggers it and it triggers these past traumas and it comes back and and that's the reality of life i think a lot of people struggle with with mental health and it's being aware of that and addressing it yeah well said uh, I, i've been through my own experiences of that and um it certainly as men as well we we yeah, yeah. generally speaking um we find it difficult to talk about it mm -hmm. or to accept it or just uh, man up get on with it yeah um, how did you get through that period in life you know any any kind of processes did you seek external help or mm -hmm. did you you know were there things you did in your routine to kind of get you out of that yeah yeah it's a really good point you bring up about men not being willing yeah. to share and it's sad and it breaks my heart yeah and luckily you know when I lost my dad at a young age, I, my mom, you know, threw us into, into um, therapy and some of the therapists that I saw completely changed the way I look at things. And I'm not afraid to ask for help. I'm not afraid to, to talk about my feelings and, and share the things that are going, going on inside. But I know a lot of men struggle with that, you know, and, um, I reached out to the mental health, you know, facilities here in Bali are not great. There's really not a whole yeah. lot of options for us. 
So what I did was I, I reached out to probably a hundred different um, mental health practitioners in Australia, which is a similar time zone. And I found one that worked and uh, she was monumental in helping me kind of deconstruct everything and, and work through things that I was going through. Um, and as on top of that, friends, you know, yeah. I, I have a great support system here and I was able to lean on them and uh, they held me up, man. They held me up and they're great. And uh, I'm forever grateful for the friends that helped me through those those rough periods, you know, yeah. at different stages of my life. Yeah. Well, good for you and, and good yeah. for them. I think it's, um, we get so focused on photographers, artists, some kind of creative output. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to get so singular with that, right? Yeah. So focus, 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 work, work, work. Yeah. When you're working for yourself, when you have a business, like, you think that's the priority and and it isn't um just it just isn't like you will you will end up doing so much damage mm -hmm. whether it's mental health physical health or often both yeah that it's sometimes irreparable or you have to take elongated periods yeah. periods off um so i think especially youngsters i i, I have the benefit of a bit of wisdom being 40 years old having Ancient. kind of made those fucking mistakes yeah, yeah. And I see youngsters now like doing really well, working their asses off and being amazing at what they do. But I'm looking at them going, just be, just please look after your health. First and foremost, uh, Yeah. building blocks of all of your success and longevity is your health Everything and, comes and mental health, especially like, yes. because I think physical health and mental, physical health goes into mental health mm -hmm. or, and vice Absolutely. versa. Like if you're, if you're prepared to start the day, then you're prepared to go and work out. Yep. You're prepared to eat, eat well, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I just think it's, uh, I'd like to talk more about it actually on yeah. on this, on the Mood podcast on our series, because I think it, and, and as you've said, it impacted your work and your creativity. Yeah, like, massively. so why, why are we not giving it more attention? Why, I know. Are, we, why are we not taking care of ourselves more? Yeah. So um, it, obviously easier said than done, but. Yeah. yeah, life is tough. Life is tough, but ultimately, at the end of the day, the things that matter most is our health, you know, mental, physical, social, the relationships that we have in our lives. Um, and with that strong foundation of health, we can thrive in business as well. So that's all we have, right? That's all we have. All we have really is our brain. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's all we have. So yeah. why not take care of it? Absolutely. Yeah. On that note. Thanks for being with yeah. us, man. Thanks so much for having me, man. Yeah, it's, it's been, been an absolute yeah. pleasure. I'm Appreciate sure everyone's it. enjoyed watching it. And um, where can people find you? Where, where can, if they don't know who you are, where can where can they find you online? Yeah, they can uh, check me out on Instagram at Sean Dalt, S-E-A-N-D-A-L-T. It's yep. a bit of a confusion. We'll put it in the caption. Anyway, yeah, put yeah. it in the caption. Um, my website, SeanDalt.com. I got a bunch of freebies on there. Cool. Um, YouTube as well. I have a bunch of free tutorials. So that's probably the best place to check it out. And, and your new course is on, on the website? Yep. So enrollment is currently closed, but we're going to be opening it probably pretty soon after this course um, goes live. So make sure you register to my email list so you can uh, check that out. And you can do that via the link in my bio. Um, it's a great course. I'm pumped about it. And I hope you guys are interested as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, best yeah. of luck and uh, see you soon, I guess. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, I'll buddy. see you soon. Cheers, mate. Appreciate it.